Evet. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Uh, let's put our phones away. I put mine away. I think it's probably recharged by now. Good morning to you online today at home. Good morning. Thanks, Liv. I love it when you guys talk to me. It's really good. And uh, people are showing up. That's really awesome. Second hour today is really important, uh, not just from a, uh, a world history standpoint, but also uh, for better or for worse, also for registration. And so uh, we're gonna have to do a little something with registration here in class. And then you guys at home, I got a little registration thing that is uh, sort of your, in addition to ABA today. Hopefully you guys have, uh, have, have registered already and then I'm supposed to check that for you. I don't really know how to do that yet, but I'll figure it out. Hopefully you guys uh, figured out how to, how to register. I don't feel like I gave you any advice or anything about uh, registration. And I think I was supposed to sell social studies classes to you. So hopefully you, you maybe took an elective next year in addition to US history or AP US history. This is kind of the, as you probably know, normal junior classes uh, here at least. So the plan for today is um, I want to talk about Renaissance art. I want to show you Renaissance art. I want to interrupt things then, and we'll get this, uh, this registration assignment done. And then I'd like you to maybe find a, a work of Renaissance art and, and, and share it with us. And, uh, and that should take us to the end of today. So hopefully that sounds pretty good to you here. Hopefully that sounds pretty good to you guys at home. Uh, if you have questions or comments, or if you want to participate as well, please feel free to. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear people turn their mic on and then, and then say something appropriate. And I'm also happy that nobody ever turns their mic on and says inappropriate things. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I've been lucky. I don't know if that happens in other classes. So if, if you want to get out your, your EQs, the piece of paper from yesterday, it, it's, it's not super important that you do this because you probably already have the answer to the question uh, of number two, the essential question number two. I know what the answer is, but I want to give you some more information about Renaissance art not just for world history class, but for your own, uh, your own knowledge or your own edification. Same for you guys at home. Maybe one of you at home could tell me what uh, EQ number two was yesterday and, and read that to us. That would be awesome. It was about realism in painting and sculpture. Excellent. Yeah, Renaissance art. The answer is realism, right? It's all about realism. And... Uh, things look more realistic, but then there's also 
some, some style things going on, some different kinds of subject matter that we'll see as you what pre-Renaissance art looks like, not very realistic. And then I'll show you what Renaissance art looks like. And we'll look at several artists and, and their works of art as well. So I will present to all of you at home. Let's see, perfect. And there's that. There we go. So uh, if you look. <laughs> okay. So once again, you don't need all of this. It's just my explanation of what Renaissance art is versus uh, pre Renaissance art. I just wanted to, to kind of show you that uh, that the subject of the art changes a little bit. The artists themselves change a little bit. Patrons who's purchasing the art changes a little bit. The purpose changes a little bit. And the significance of it for us looking at it is also uh, a change a little bit. So in terms of subject, I'm going to say that both Renaissance art and pre-Renaissance art, mostly religious. religious. For, for Renaissance art, it's probably 60%. For pre-Renaissance art, it's probably 95% religious. You know how religious people are in the medieval period, how concerned they are with getting to heaven, not sinning, and so on. So anything that's going to be created art-wise is indicative of that with lots and lots of religious subjects. There's also some rulers, like some kings or some nobles in pre-Renaissance art. You see those people in Renaissance art as well. But the new stuff for Renaissance art is mythology. And, and whose mythology? Which people? Greek, Greek. Greek and Roman. Roman. And they're basically the same, right? Greeks and Romans have the same kinds of gods. The Romans steal the Greek gods and then change their names a lot of the time. Same gods and goddesses, though. So you've got that going on. The Renaissance is all about humanism, right? Uh, people who are famous, people who are showing up their talents, people who are rich, people who are enjoying their wealth. And so you see a lot of that. You just get sort of extraordinary regular people rich people talented people um you know but they are just normal people they're not jesus they're not david from the bible you know they're, they're just rich people and then i won't show you this too much but even at the very end of the renaissance start to get into nature animals nature scene and stuff like that because they're god's creation i guess it kind of fits but also it's a chance for somebody just to show off how well they can, there's this one guy who sketches with, uh, with different kinds of pencils, he sketches a rabbit and it looks like a photograph. It looks really real. So he does this just to show off, not because the rabbit is a saint or you know Jesus rabbit or anything like that. So in terms of artists, you, you, you can't probably imagine this, but before the Renaissance, people don't sign their artwork. And post-Renaissance, everybody signs their artwork, right? Who did that painting? Who did that sculpture? The sculpture is carved into the stone. In the painting, somewhere they put like an initial or they put their name. They don't do that before the Renaissance because they don't think it's their talent so much that, that they should be showing off. Who allowed them to have the talent to do the artwork? Yeah. yeah. And if, if you know, they should decide it, God, or God let me do this, that would be just as good. In the Renaissance, because of the Renaissance, you get Michelangelo, or you get you know Da Vinci, and you get these little um, signatures so that you know exactly who did it. To be honest, they actually paint themselves into paintings to show you know to show how how great they are. They might even put themselves in a religious painting. They're hanging out there, you know, looking at baby Jesus too. It's it's a, it seems really sinful to do that, but that's what they start to do. And they become superstars. Name a Renaissance artist. Michelangelo. Michelangelo, perfect. Name another one. Da Vinci. Yeah. Uh, name, name a, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Donatello. There you go. So you get these guys whose names, and oftentimes it's just one name, right? It's just Michelangelo instead of his full name. That's how, you know, that's how famous these, these people come. They come. The patrons of people who buy the art are largely the church. The church has money before the Renaissance. The church has money during the Renaissance. They spend tons and tons of money 
on art. Uh, that becomes a problem, as, as you'll see uh, going on here at the, at the end of the week. There's also rulers who are buying art. You know, they want to show themselves. The king wants a statue of himself. The king wants a portrait of himself. Get the same kind of thing over here in the Renaissance, but you also have those extraordinary Renaissance men who are wanting to pay for art, to beautify their, their home that they live in or whatever kind of meeting space that they might have or palace that they might uh, work in or whatever it happens to be. You know, wealthy people are now buying art and oftentimes of themselves. Finally, uh, no, not finally, the purpose is religious, the pur purpose is political, the purpose is religious, the pur purpose is political. It's also vanity. It's also showing off, who am I? Look at me, you know, I have, uh, Da Vinci has painted me. And then you had to get Da Vinci to do it, or you had to get Raphael to do it, because they're the superstar artist. And that superstar artist is showing off their Renaissance qualities as well. And finally, the significance is what kind of a place we're looking at, what kind of a time we're living in. Is it a super religious time? Is it a feudal time where kings and, and nobles are in charge of everything? Or is it this new time when some humans are showing off their talents, becoming famous, and, and, and this is why we see the, the changes? All right, questions at home or questions from you guys? Perfect. Let's look at art then. I'm going to get rid of this little thing because it's interfering with stuff. So all of these images are pre-Renaissance. They're before the Renaissance. And I don't think they are particularly realistic or great. I can't get anywhere near this. I do stick figure art when I do art. Maybe you guys are better than, than I am. Um, but uh, And I've never tried to sculpt anything. I used to make things out of clay when I was in elementary school, maybe you guys did too. But uh, not super realistic, really not very much perspective. Uh, what is perspective? Yeah. The big view. The big view. So perspective is like, when I look at you with my, with my eye, and, and, and you know, I, I, if I stand like, if I stand over here, um, Looking at, uh, sorry, sorry for you guys at home, but um, you know, I, I've, I've got Gabe, I've got, I've got Riley over farther away, and I've got Deja right in front of me. In my mind's eye, who, who looks bigger? Deja does, right? Like if I do my hands, she, she looks like this big to me, and if I go over to Riley, it looks like you know four inches. So that's perspective, right? And you can put that in art. It's not really evident here too much, but it will be. When you when you look at the Renaissance art, so uh, finally it's still mostly religious. Um, I've got a couple of rulers in here for you, just to kind of show you what that looks like. But you know, Jesus on the cross with a bunch of very sad people around him, very religious. In the middle is pretty religious too. So let's let's uh, I'll just kind of talk about these. The one on the far left are a couple of nobles, a, a nobleman and a noblewoman. They are in a church in Germany. They are statues that carved out of stone. Uh, how, how, how realistic do you, I know it looks pretty good, right? They, they look like human beings. Their clothes look like clothes, don't they? Look fairly realistic. Here's the bit that isn't super realistic. What do they look like from behind? They're flat. Yeah, they, they're, they're, their backs, their butts are just straight up against a pillar, which is a lot easier to do. Imagine you're trying to carve something. You're trying to carve a human being. Out of out of soft stone, it's so much easier if you don't have to worry about what it looks like from the back. In fact, these guys are elevated up on a pillar, and so we don't really have to look all that realistic anyway. People aren't getting up close to them, and so so it looks nice, but not three D, uh, really. I like this this middle um, this middle work of art is really funny to me. Um, what? individual things, and I'm, I'm hoping you guys at home will also like to tune in with your microphone, put your microphone on and, and tell me, what things do you see in this painting? That, yeah, that's horse. There, there is a, well, there is a centaur. Centaur, yeah. Yeah, half man, half horse. And he's, where, where's the centaur? Approximately for those people at home. He's like, 
he's coming out of the forest, and we, there's a forest, right? He doesn't have like the holy ring. No, he doesn't. He's he's not he's not a saint. Yeah. Right. He is a mythical creature, which is kind of weird to the story. Uh, but the other two guys are saints. They're religious figures. What do you notice about the centaur, or what's missing from the centaur? Clothes. A whole bunch of them, right? It's kind of hard, I think, to actually, you know, paint or sketch a horse. And if you want to have the centaur in the story, but make it easier on yourself, because maybe your talent lacks a little bit, why don't you just like put, the, put the, the first part of the horse there, or the first part of the centaur, just his legs. You can tell that he's got horse legs. Uh, and then just leave the rest. Hide it behind the horse. quote unquote tree. trees and forest. So is you know it's a forest. I know it's a forest. We know those are trees. But have you ever seen trees like that? Or have you ever seen a it looks like there's a cave. There's a cave. Have you ever seen a cave that looks like that? <laughs> no, they're not realistic. But it doesn't matter that much. You know it's a cave. You know it's a forest. You know it's a centaur. We're good. We're done, basically, because it's pre-Renaissance. They don't have the talent in order to make those things look really real. What's happening at, at, at the center and front of the painting? It's a hug, but it's not a hug, is it? Yes, not. It's isn't it the? It's like the cave and the forest and the trees. It's the idea of a hug. Have you ever seen two people hug like this, where they, you know, they're several feet apart and they bend very slightly at the waist and put their arms straight out? That is not a hug. That's the kind of hug I would attempt to draw or paint, right? Not realistic. When people hug, that's really a hard thing to actually capture in art. And 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 so awkward hug of these two guys. Look at the feet. If you can tell the feet, the feet are just all you know messed up. They're just really weird. But once again, it doesn't matter. It's the idea of a hug, not realistic. You have oh, one last thing I want to say too. Can you see that it's the same guy? The guy talking to the centaur, the guy hugging, and the guy wandering? Same guy. The reason for that is, this is not a snapshot in time, this is telling you a story. The perspective you see is not based on distance, it's based on time. So what happens first, the hug or the wandering? He's wandering, and, and then the he gets to the trail, and he meets the centaur, and then he meets the guy. You can, it's, isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. That you can tell a story by putting the person smaller in the time back. So that, too, is kind of a difference between Renaissance art and pre-Renaissance art. Uh, over here, you have Charlemagne, the famous emperor from 800 or so. Um, this is pretty much one of the very only statues of a guy on horseback from the medieval period. They did a lot of horseback statues in, in Greece and Rome, and this, sometimes the horses were rearing up and stuff and, and looked very realistic. How realistic is Charlemagne? Look at his face, look at his clothes. How realistic is the horse? It's pretty good. Good too. It's not like super realistic. Yeah. Aren't horses really kind of like, muscular and veiny and much less doughy than that it's and, kind of small it, yeah. yeah and when you sit on a horse it's hard to show how a person sits on a horse you have to be a really good artist in order to do that and the clothes i mean this is all metal so wow good job but it's not renaissance quality yet and his face too it's just very doughy and like not so, uh, and then up there, that, that's a that's a classic kind of pre-Renaissance. The bodies are weird, um, and this time it's not about so much perspective, but it's about size. Size indicates something. What do you think size indicates? Or importance. importance. Who's the biggest? Jesus. Jesus is big. Right? He's bigger than everyone else because he's more important than everyone else. And then there's all these people who are doing these really odd poses. I'll also think, if you look here at Jesus' feet, 
Well, maybe that. Maybe I'm not right. Maybe I'm not right about that. I thought that might be a baby, and so we would have sort of like a you know beginning story Christmas, end story Easter, uh, but maybe or like gambling. I think they're actually gambling for his clothes. That's part of the story as well. Um, yeah. But you know that's not the way a person really hangs on a cross. It just doesn't look like that. Yeah. And and you know this this lady in particular who's who's leaning far to the right that's just weird. I think that's a you know it, it's supposed to show sadness. It's supposed to show um, something like that. But so that's all pre Renaissance. Let's get into or medieval art. Let's get into some Renaissance art. If you want to add these to number two, some of these things it would be fine. Um, remember artists have more talent and and so things are more realistic so they're showing perspective in a really nice way it's also a rebirth of all of these things that that really the greeks and the romans were doing really quite uh filled with talent let's say busts that somebody from no arms and somebody from the chest up oftentimes you see roman emperors white marble chest up busts right uh horsemen people on horseback like i said nudes crazy for the nudes crazy for the human body they want to see naked people or they they had naked people all the time just as the way it was and greek and roman mythology as well gods and goddesses oftentimes still in the renaissance 70 percent i don't know what it is is still very religious sometimes with these you know sometimes uh perspective plus religious or um I don't know, nudes and religious, which is kind of odd, right? Nude in medieval times is sin. It's it's sex. It's, you know, people don't like that. They don't want to see it. And yet, now we get this, this whole different change because of, of uh, the Renaissance. Human beings become important. And I'll show you human beings, like Mona Lisa, you know, La Giaconda. Just somebody who's not a religious figure, somebody who is a Renaissance man or a Renaissance woman. Right. Uh, do you know the story of David and Goliath from the Bible, from the Old Testament? So David is a shepherd, and he's he's basically a young man. He's a boy, and he he has to fight the uh, the giant, maybe a guy ten feet, twelve feet tall, named named Goliath from the Philistine army. And the idea, I think, is instead of having both David's army and Goliath's army fight, everybody die. That maybe just you know. Send out your champion, send out your toughest guy, and those two will fight, and whoever wins, that's the battle. Which sounds like a really good way of doing it, right? And so nobody in, in, uh, in, among David's people who's willing to challenge a giant, and so they send out the shepherd boy to go and fight the giant. He has a sling. You know, it's kind of like a, a slingshot in a way, just done, done a little bit more um i don't know with, with more talent you have to kind of wind up your arm and send this send a stone about the size of a golf ball at a wolf that's trying to eat your sheep well this is this is the weapon that david is is trying to use to kill a giant and the giant goliath has a sword apparently well the two get together and you can imagine it's going to be a slaughter but it isn't david uses the sling he uses the stone he he flings it at, at the at the giant goliath hits Goliath in the head, Goliath falls down. David runs over, picks up Goliath's sword and chops his head off. And then David, according to the work of art I'm gonna show you, then David gives this kind of like victory pose, standing over Goliath's head. This is Donatello, his, his David statue. What's David wearing, do you think, in biblical times? Like what would he really be wearing? loincloth. <laughs> okay, maybe a loincloth. Oh, a tunic thing. A tunic thing, right? A tunic, okay. Like a almost like a toga or a oh, tunic, something like that. Maybe sandals, right? Um, okay. And and Goliath is gonna have a little bit of armor on, maybe not not like medieval armor, but some sort of armor. And then you know you know what a victory pose looks like, right? If you just killed a giant, you got a victory pose. Okay. Here's 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 the here's uh, Donatello's version of David. This is the first statue since Roman times that is freestanding. That's three D that you can walk, walk around. Here it is. On the left. Kind of a bad memory. All right. 
thought he was more ripped. Yeah. Yeah. Skinny he's, boy. He's skinny. I'm gonna say he's sassy. Yeah. yeah. He's got a sassy pose yeah. going on. And what's he wearing? Nothing. I think he has sandals on. He has a hat on. And a hat. What the heck? All right, so <laughs> it doesn't say in the Bible. And then David took all his clothes off, except for his sandals, and he was wearing a sassy hat. And then he took on Goliath. He should have. I think he threw you a fight the other day. It's kind of intimidating. intimidating. <laughs> but, but, but not, not, not this guy. This guy naked. And in fact, if you walk through this door behind him, and you saw him from behind, what would you think? Hey. Yeah. I think you think it's a girl. You think, I wonder what she looks like. And go around, oh, it's a, it's a guy. Do you see Goliath's head? Okay. Where? Oh. Sassy victory pose for David. It's very unusual. He's naked because of the Renaissance. I think Donatello is showing off that he can do a new statue, which is a heck of a lot harder than to have somebody in sort of you know, a tunic or robes like Uta and Eckhart were. So uh, it kind of looks realistic. He looks a little doughy, like you said. Why isn't he, you know, ripped? Why isn't he, is he muscular? He looks a little doughy, looks a little sassy, but he's just a boy. Um, and, and there will be plenty of time in the Renaissance for people who are very muscular. This is Gata Malata. Uh, it's a guy on horseback. I think that horse looks pretty realistic, don't you? Carved out of stone. The guy sitting on it looks pretty realistic. He's a military commander. He saved the city from attack. And the people of the city loved his talent so much, loved him for ruling over them and protecting them so much. They Donatello to do this, this uh, work of art of him on horseback. It's very powerful, right? So um, that gets put up in the city, and then everybody can you know, respect it. And uh, it's, it's kind of weird. His, his real name is Enrico Di Narni, but uh, the work of art and his nickname is Gata Melata, which means honey cat. It's catchy. It, it, it's kind of a weird nickname. But it sounds nice when you say it, Gata Melata. But honey cat, honey cat's coming. And he's, he's bringing his, his soldiers with him. We better get out of here if honey cat's coming. Very nice work. Here's the School of Athens by Raphael. Where's Athens? Athens. Greece. Greece. <laughs> Athens is in Athens, but it's in Greece. These are all the famous uh, Greek thinkers, philosophers, uh, mathematicians, architects from Greek history. This is done by Raphael. And Raphael uses some of his artist friends and perhaps even himself as some of these famous Greek and Roman people. And so uh, if you look at this guy right here at the center of the painting, for I know you guys probably can't see what I'm pointing at, but at the center of the painting, there are two guys. Those two guys represent uh, Plato and Aristotle. Plato is pointing up and Aristotle is pointing down. Plato is actually Leonardo da Vinci. And one of these guys here, I think this guy on the left who's looking at us, I think that might be Raphael himself. And, you know, representing, standing in for some sort of famous Greek philosophy period of time. Look at the perspective. The closer figure. Yeah, because these guys are closer to us. This is Michelangelo, by the way, hanging out with the big stone block um, and whoever he represents as a Greek god. But the people who are closer to us, this is real, like, distance. And then look at going back with these arches. Isn't that kind of cool? The way that, the, that looks very realistic, realism. And once again, Greek people, uh, they're fully clothed. That's nice. <laughs> they're clothed. Uh, there's no reason to have these guys naked, I guess, for Raphael. The statues are naked. The statues are naked, yeah. The statues, it's in Athens. And, you know, they're Greek statues, so very cool. Here's Leonardo da Vinci's probably two most famous works. You've got uh, Mona Lisa, of course, on the right in the Louvre today that you could go and stand in line to see. I think she looks pretty dark. I've heard it's smaller than it. It's super small. Yeah, it's very, very small. Um, maybe maybe you don't see it. I don't know. You know, if you're ever if you're ever there, sometimes 
maybe taken a, taken a different path than everybody else. Um, everyone's just there. You, know, you don't necessarily have to see the Mona Lisa. Maybe you can see some lesser known works and, and enjoy them without standing in line for 30 minutes. Uh, on the left, we have this, this work of art that is in a church. It started to fall apart really quite soon after uh, after the Da Vinci painted it, which is really kind of sad because it's an awesome painting. Look at the perspective. Who's the most important person in this painting? Jesus. Jesus, right in the middle. And look at how he's framed in that window. Look at the ceiling, how the ceiling goes back. It's really pretty cool. And there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's, um, what is it, the Da Vinci Code? I don't know if you guys have seen that movie or read the book. It's kind of, kind of cool. Uh, but there are five different mini scenes within within the larger work. Can you see that? There are like three people, a cluster of people, five different clusters of people, and they're all doing something. They're discussing um, something that Jesus just said to them, and, and basically Jesus. Like one of you will betray me. Yeah, one of you will betray me, and they're all sort of arguing with each other. What What does he mean? Not me. It's not you know. And so it's it's causing a big stir. Um, the other thing that, that caused a big stir is when he said, uh, "Eat this bread and drink this this uh, this wine. It's my body and it's my blood." And I'm like, what, what is this about? Um, so anyway, a classic and, and maybe one of the most important scenes from Christianity. The other one, perhaps, being Jesus then on the cross, which happens soon after. Kind of kind of cool uh, kind of cool picture or painting. If you guys. Very realistic, right? People look really realistic. The perspective is there, and uh, and it's a religious religious work. Here's another. There's another David statue. This one is a is uh, is a giant, uh, very large, and well, it's it's a different period of time in the story. It's the same one. It's the same story. So it's the same David. It's also Renaissance nude, very nude, right? But really, Medici family. yeah. So the Medici family pay Michelangelo to create the statue. The statue represents the Medici family. The statue also re represents Florence, the city where the Medici, you know, control, live, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, pretty realistic, right? And there you go. More defined David, right? Less kind of doughy, more of a man than a boy and not standing on Goliath's head. Different period of time. He's got a better pose, too. He's got a much better pose, but it's not a victory pose. And his, his right hand looks huge. Yeah. yeah, his hands are really big. This is, a, this is supposed to sit up on something, and you're supposed to look up at it. And so the way that Michelangelo creates it, he knows that he wants it to look a certain way based on that. And that's why the head is too big, and that's why the hands are too big. But in general, he can make a human body look really, really realistic. Um, what part of the story is this? If he's not standing on Goliath's head, can you imagine time-wise what part of the story is this? Before. Yeah. And and Gabe, how do you know that? Um, I'm not sure. What's he looking at? Um, who's who's over here that he's the wall jesus good guess but no goliath he's mad dogging goliath wait goliath is a statue next to him in there no but goliath in the story right in the story david comes out i guess completely naked he doesn't even have sandals on or a funny hat and instead of being you know you expect in the story if you read this scared he's with god's help he's going to kill goliath um but he is, he's basically mad dogging. He's, you know, giving him the death stare. Like, you're a giant. I have a sling and stone, but I'm going to waste you. And then he does. And, and so this is like the Medici family giving the death stare to anyone who wants to take on them. Or Florence giving, you know, other city states the death stare. You want to take on Florence? We'll bring you down. Kind of a cool statue. Yeah. When did the mafia start? Um, it's good. <laughs> Honestly, the, the, the people, the politicians and, and everything and, and, and people living in these city-states are kind of mafia-like already. 
Medici sounds like an object. In, in fact, yeah. I, I mean, the, I think there is a continuum of that kind of thing. People try to assassinate them. They assassinate other people. They're warring within Florence. I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's really pretty extreme. People get poisoned. People get stabbed to death on their way to church. So it's very, it's very mafia-like all the way back in the 1500s as well. Here's Michelangelo doing the Sistine Chapel. This is the Pope's Chapel in the Vatican. Up on the ceiling, there are all these scenes from the Bible. There are all these religious scenes. There's even this, this bit here where this is God creating Adam. You know, sort of this the finger-to-finger -finger spark of giving him life. And then what do you notice about any of this that looks Renaissance to you? Uh, nudity. Nudity. Angels. Angels. Perspective. Perspective. God. Religion. <laughs> Religion, right? But, but you know, uh, look, well, I don't, I don't, what does God look like before that? Uh, young. <laughs> and a copy of the um, Adam? No. God? I think it's cloud? It's a void of or a bunch of figures, angels, and whatnot? Yeah. Do you notice that almost everybody except for God is nude? And do you notice anything about their bodies? Well, the bodies are nude. No, it has like a little bowl. Yeah. In, in general, though, he looks like strong, but he's okay, yeah. He's meaty, but he's super muscular. All of these people are super muscular. All of the Bible, uh, you know, people who are being driven into hell here at the bottom of, of the uh, of the painting, and people who are being lifted up into heaven. Everyone is kind of like they've been they've been hanging out at the gym for three hours a day their entire life. They just got pumped in. Yep. So, um, so you get you know this combination of religion and Greco-Roman sorts of naked bodies and so on. Were there any color differences between the Renaissance and? Um, it's a bit more colorful, I think, in in the Renaissance, um, especially with things like shadow shadowing and. and, and that. Um, it, the, I don't think there are, are any amazing technological differences. Like suddenly they're doing oil-based paints and, and things like that. Getting close to the end here, this is Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Venus is the Roman goddess of love. She's naked. Um, you know, everything looks pretty realistic, I think. Um, the, the, you know, she's being born out of this giant shell. Uh, the water isn't great in terms of realism, but, um, but it's, it's a very nice sort of mythological scene that Botticelli says, well, you know, it's an allegory of Christian love. And people are like, no, I think you're actually just you're making a Roman goddess. Um, but it's, it's a very nice. Uh... Finally, the, the the northern Renaissance we talked about yesterday is a little bit more caring about other people, maybe a little bit less selfish. It's hard to see that in art. But what we do have is I'll show you a couple of people who are really involved in trying to improve society. And then a guy uh, who's a king and, and one of his many wives just to mention to you. This is Erasmus of Rotterdam, the guy writing, and he writes, uh, he writes a lot of cr a criticism of the Catholic Church. And this is uh, Thomas More. He's Henry VIII's chancellor, uh, but he also writes a book called Utopia, in which he, he describes this fantastical place that is much better than where people are living in Europe. You know, there's no torture, there's no greed, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, Thomas More. Thomas More actually gets his head chopped off by Henry VIII. They used to be friends. Uh, Henry VIII decides to create his own church after not being able to get a divorce from his wife, uh, chops his friend's head off, and marries in total six different women. A couple of them get divorces, like this one here, this is Anna Cleves, number four. Uh, a couple of them chops their heads off. Did they have a choice in marrying him? They wanted to marry him because they became a queen. But then it's really kind of dangerous to be a queen. Yeah. So if you don't, if you don't have like a son or something. That was the problem. Is Henry's looking for a son, and his first queen couldn't. He was getting too old to provide him for one. He fell in love with someone else. We'll we'll go through the whole soap opera on Friday. But um, here he is, and here she is. You know, um, royalty, a ruler, 
a very short-lived queen. I'm not even sure if she was actually queen because he married her sight unseen. And then when she showed up, he didn't like the way that she looked and asked for an immediate divorce. It's really kind of sad. Always see your wife or see your husband before you marry them, it, you know, even if it's been arranged, I think. So that's that. That's that's uh, uh, that. Any any questions from uh, from home or from class? You guys good too at home? Okay, good. Uh, here's what I need you to do. We have a, another assignment today. Hopefully, you're done with your registration, and hopefully, you can upload your registration documents into um, this thing that I've got. So if you guys here at home, open up your, your uh, computers. <laughs> yes, no, I'll show that to you really quickly. Um, everybody open up your computer and we're going to upload your registration to me. I'm supposed to check it for you. I have no idea how to register. <laughs> um, I just know that I'm for classes that you've signed up for and if you have messed that up in some way, I fill out a form on you. I'm looking up this thing with my calendar, so I still have it. Sounds good. I will fill out a form on you and, and be done. Um, so let me show Noah the slide really quickly. Did you want the, the description of the slide, I suppose? This one. And hopefully you got that. I have a um, a video maybe that will help out. Um, let me just show this to you guys. I, I hope this helps you. You know, I don't I don't know what I'm doing. Hi everyone. So registration is going to be wrapping up on February seventeenth. In order to complete this process, we need you to turn in your academic plan to your second hour teacher. The so turning in your academic plan requires you to log into your student portal and go to Infinite Campus. In this example, we have a fictitious student, Michael Knox. And in this, we're going to go to his academic plan. We're going to click next or proceed to your four year plan. And again, this is where you register. In this case, this is a 10th grade student registering for 11th grade. So again, you want to make sure you have seven S1 classes and seven S2 classes. I'm going to stop that for a second. I don't know if you guys at home or if you guys here in class. Does this seem like something you could do really quickly? Is this is this all good? Yeah. Okay. I don't think I'll be able to submit mine because my prompter I manually do it himself. Okay. Yeah, Sounds good. Um, it, this is kind of like a deal where, where where I'm like you. I have something I have to do, and I'm going to do my best to do it. And if it if you know, you have a thing going on for some reason. All I do is fill out paperwork on you and say, so and so didn't turn it into me and I couldn't count, and you guys deal with it. So, you know how you just have to do stuff sometimes. <laughs> That's me today. That's heck, it's me every day. Here, you're going to go to the course plan report tab. When you select this, it's going to automatically generate the PDF. Please use this PDF and submit it to your second hour teacher on February 17th in the mentioned ABA for that day. That's it. Remember, your student portal, academic plan, course plan report. Is that Taylor Johnson? Yeah. He seems like a nice guy. Oh, yeah, he's great. One counselor I really hate, and that person's me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't hate any of the counselors. You guys at home, are you guys okay with all that? The the actual thing that, that you're turning in is over here on the right hand side, the step five. Hopefully you're able to turn that in to me. They set that up for me. I'm not doing anything. It's uh, in Schoology on our page. Do you see that, that I've assigned that to you? Did I assign that to you? Yeah. Okay. It says submissions there. Hopefully you're submitting that to me. Hopefully you guys at home are submitting that to me too. The 
the more of you who submit and the more of you who have the right number of classes, the less work, the less work I end up doing, which makes me happy. I have a question. I hope I can answer it. Um, it says like US history and online. US history, yeah. which one yeah. do you choose? Um, well, it's, it's just that. I, I would say, from what I've heard, most people are just taking a, you know, people want to um, want to have the real experience and they're tired of online stuff. But th there are going to be next year the, the possibility of of doing kind of what you're doing now um, a couple of times okay. a week with, with synchronous and then three days a week with asynchronous assignments. So kind of just your choice of, of how you like to how you might want to do that class. OK, thank you. Yeah, sure. I did it. I could answer that question. I'm really happy. <laughs> I could also tell you the difference between U.S. history and AP U.S. history. If you want to hear that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do. I'm going to put like the PDF inside, like the similar assignment thing. Uh, I think if you go to the where it shows upload, if you go to file. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because I'm not seeing any submissions from anybody, which is freaking me out. I'm about to that's probably I need to change it to what is this nine? Oh yeah. This is nine. Yes, perfect. All you guys at home who've done this, I really appreciate it. It's really nice. Thank you so much. Got fourteen out of thirty-two. Cool. Yeah, I doubt that. It says like for fourth PDF. It says um, I got sixteen. I'm loving it. Did I already talk about the Minneapolis Institute of Arts? You guys should, if, has, have, have you been there? Yeah. MIA? Yeah. It's really nice. They've got some great, great, from all over the world and all kinds of different time periods. The other art museums in town are more, which I don't particularly care for. Wait, is anybody working for West History? Nice. Well, if, if you guys have uploaded your, your uh, schedule to me or your, your registration to me, you are done for the day. I thank you for doing that, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the lecture today. So have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. We got a, a three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, you too. I'll see ya. Bye, Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. I think yesterday I forgot how hard it is to say the same things over and over and over again, like four times a day.
felt really burdensome, but I'm kind of used to it again. <laughs> How was What's that? Um, yeah, if, if it's synchronous. If I just put the, if I just do the lecture once and you guys just, you know, you guys do it from YouTube. I just sit back and wait to see what, what you did on the, on the quiz or the lecture. Now, uh, what's my hand? I don't pay Rick Sunday. Gabriel going dead. Twenty one, not bad. Hope you guys figure it out. I'm going to see you guys later. Bye-bye.